This is the Superpowered Mind podcast for inquiring individuals who are tired of the struggle for peace, happiness, and clarity. I'm Claire Diamond, ready to help you explore the principles of the mind, the self, and reality to unlock ultimate mental freedom. This podcast is the one to listen to if you're ready to experience the capabilities of the superpowered mind. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our weekly podcast. And today we're looking at whether there is a more useful definition of the ego that we can use. And this is prompted by a study that Tia Ho, my friend, sent me that said, people's egos get bigger after meditation and yoga. And they based this on the fact of of three measures, one of which was a measure of how the participant compared themselves to the other yoga students in terms of their ability. The other was a narcissistic inventory, and the other was a self-esteem scale, which are statements like, at the moment I have high self-esteem. Do you agree or disagree? And the problem with this study is it's pointing to ego as being a, as being any sort of reference to how good, how well we can do something or how well we feel in our own skin, which isn't really useful as a, as a, (laughs) Uh, to put that as a, as problematic, is it really? You know, that's not what yoga and meditation aren't trying to get rid of that. My goodness, what's, what would be the point? No, yoga and meditation, when done really with full integrity and, and when guided by a teacher who is really grounded in, in reality, yoga and meditation serve to in uh, integrate i would say integrate that part of the human mind the human subconscious that is on high alert because of past experiences and because of a belief system that says i'm not safe that's what ego is it's not it's not knowing whether you can do a pose better than someone else because of course you probably can and it's, and it's just good to recognize that. It's fine. There's no problem in, in being more skilled in certain areas. It's, it's just facts of life. No, the, the really useful thing for us to consider in relation to ego is that it is a product of a belief system of lack. It is not a, a product of stability which a self-esteem test would indicate. It is not a sense of being whole and complete and able. No, it's the, it's the total opposite. Ego, which is a mind claimed by a, an obsession, would not even be too strong a word, with securing the self-identity. And that doesn't come from stability. It comes from lack. And so there's three things that I think are much more powerful measures of ego. And, and we can see, we can really see whether certain things, certain activities, certain therapies, certain approaches decrease or increase this. So the three things that I would say are, first of all, Ego is the fight or flight response as though life is in danger when there is no actual physical threat in that moment. So it means that the whole system is being taken over by a a threat to the believed self, which is what ego really is, isn't it? It's the, it's the believed self, the identity that believed me separate, vulnerable, independent. And right now in this moment, it's under threat. And that might be in a meeting. It might be around the Christmas table. It might be in a shop when there's absolutely zero danger to the, to the physical. And yet the, the mental, the psychological 
self is fearing for its life. So that fight or flight, um, we've also have fawn in that as well, response, which is like instinctive, isn't it? It's coming from the from the root psychology of of the individual, largely coming from past experiences of 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 trauma or wounding, where it really does look like the worst is going to happen in that moment. And so that vigilance and that enormity of reaction to what might be completely innocuous things, a slight glance, tone of voice, a a quick movement. It's coming from a learned response. And what is being protected in that moment is a idea of self. It's not the actual body that's, that's under threat. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is that the, the ego identity is made up of unachievable wants. And these unachievable wants drive behavior. And what happens is that it looks as though if I try hard enough, if I put enough effort, if I put enough vigilance, attention, focus, um, if I if I people please enough, if I help enough, if I earn enough, if I'm beautiful enough, then I'm going to get what I think I need. Then I'm going to get the feeling of being complete, the feeling of being whole. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be peaceful. I'll be secure. And these wants, of course, are unsatisfiable. They cannot be fulfilled. They relate to this quest to find wholeness in separation, which is literally impossible to do. And yet, it just doesn't look impossible. It looks like one day I'm going to achieve all of that. And along the way, there might be moments where we, you know, we do get enough recognition or attention or a reward or someone says, you know, Claire, you're the best thing ever. And there's that blip, there's that moment of, oh, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm, I'm worthy. I'm, I'm whole. And then second later gone. And then we're straight back on the hamster wheel. And so these underlying unachievable wants that cannot be fulfilled are the wants of the ego. They're the wants of the, of the identified self and they're driving all action. And so what, what happens is life becomes ongoing disappointment, ongoing being let down, ongoing burnout, exhaustion, because there's just this constant, constant drive. I mean, it makes so much sense, you know, especially given our, our first point of fight, flight. You know, it's, it looks like we're securing our whole being through these wants. Um, so the motivation is through the roof in these areas, and yet they can never be achieved. And the confusion comes because of these mini reliefs where it looks like it is being achieved and it's and it's just not it's a tiny fraction of a second and then it's straight back into the the grind of of trying to find wholeness and separation and it can't be done and then the third area is the identification with mind which is really interesting for all of us to consider and I've put it in here because maybe it's the, it's the ultimate one, the ultimate presence of ego is that the mind believes itself, which is quite, it's quite interesting. And, and, I, and I really think it's why often very powerful minds, minds that are so able or so creative, so fast, often get caught up in this loop of everything looks like it can be solved at a mind level. And so the problem of identity, of self, of what am I, and of what the world is in relation to the I, looks like it can be solved at mind level. And so these powerful, highly imaginative or highly creative, 
highly analytical minds go to work on themselves and go round and round and round, creating more and more confusion because the mind that is believing itself has, has no freedom, has no way out. It, it, the only recourse is to try to use thought analysis to try to find freedom or peace and it can't and and so it's I think it's no surprise that you know people in my courses like powerful minds and often so so unhappy within that powerful mind only because it looks as though using that mind is the only option and what I find incredible is when the mind gets shown how it works, what it's really about, these powerful minds are now set free of that loop of trying to find security within itself and instead recognize what the mind actually does. Really, really recognize that that creative and analytical power set free in the world, in the relative world of actual problems is is a superpower and the mind doesn't have to believe that what it creates is true and particularly in regard to the self-identity when powerful minds and 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 it's it's so logical it's just a feast for an able mind to recognize that 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 self-identity that ego is a believed point of separation and independent choice that that literally can't exist and now the mind ceases its identification the belief system that held everything so rigidly and looked like all the solutions had to be found within those walls that's that's liberated now that's set free and so the mind starts watching itself and that's and that's the end of identification because now there is this the recognition that the consciousness witnessing presence awareness is the only truth for the mind and at the same time there is this powerful human capacity of creating and analyzing and those powers can be engaged in problems that now have nothing to do with solving the the original overarching influencing everything issue of how to how to secure the identity and so now this mind can move into the future can move into other people's heads can go back in time, back into the past, all without trying to manipulate it or strategize it or desperately seek within it or resist within it in order to secure the ego. And so the third area is the end of identification with mind and the beginning of the liberation of the mind. So those are our three areas that I would propose as much, much more helpful to understand what is going on with the ego rather than, you know, I'm, I can do a downward dog better than someone else. <laughs> Cause you probably can. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with anything apart from downward dogs. That's, you know, useful in that context, but in terms of overall living and, and of freedom and peace, and profound connection and ability to go out into the world, understanding the ego from the point of view of the fight flight impulse from the bank of unachievable wants that dictate all behavior. And then finally from the crunch of this identified mind that continually believes itself 
These are areas that I think when the mind looks at and when the body is allowed to open up to and when the whole system is in inquiry about what is actually true, then this vigilant, vulnerable, obsessive, exhausted perspective of what we are can finally dissolve, soften, be integrated, be understood for what it is. And um, yeah, that's, that's really the only way that the ego ends. Thank you for listening to Superpowered Mind with me, Claire Diamond. If you want extra support in the exploration of your mind, download our exclusive subliminal recording, especially for podcast listeners, on bit.ly slash podcast subliminal.